Wilco Corporation, world's largest radio manufacturer, presents your Radio Hall of Fame. Each week, for one full hour, the stars made great by your recognition of their achievements are brought to you by Philco Corporation. Make us today of radar and electronic equipment to help win the war. Make us tomorrow of products for good living in a world of peace. Our mistress of ceremonies today was cradled in show business. Her parents owned theaters in Minnesota and California, and when a child, she sang in them. She was nurtured in Bowdoin. And she graduated into motion pictures, where her charm, acting ability, and her singing soon established her as a star. A few years ago, she won a Special Academy Award for her work in *The Wizard of Oz*, and since then, she has introduced some of the screen's biggest song hits. Her latest starring vehicle, Metro Goldwyn Mayer's *Meet Me in St. Louis*, is a smash. So no wonder that on a program which honors superlative performance in the field of entertainment. You honor a unique product of that field. Life's cover girl of the week, Judy Garland. For the opening of my picture, and I came back here early, especially to be on your radio hall of fame today. I hope you don't think that's just a lot of words, because it happens to be the truth. You see, I really and truly feel it's a compliment to be your mistress of ceremonies on such a fine show, and I'm very glad we have such a grand-looking audience, including 500 servicemen from the Hollywood Guild Canteen, who are all my friends. I hope. Hi, boys. <laughs> what I like to hear. <laughs> well, anyway. We've got a grand lineup today: Lum and Abner, and Jerry Colonna, and Les Paul and his trio, and of course Paul Whiteman. That's right, Judy. And may I congratulate you at this late date on the grand way you sang the trolley song? Oh, thank you. Is that the first time it's been on the Radio Hall of Fame, Jimmy? 
The first. Oh, sister, that trolley song has been sung on this program so much you'd think we were sponsored by a traction company. Believe me. <laughs> but nobody sings it quite like you. Oh, well, maybe your next singer will do it better. Oh, Judy, as far as the trolley song is concerned, this is the end of the line. <laughs> but don't let that bother you. Long after victory, people will be playing your recording of the trolley song. Oh, I certainly hope so, Jimmy. And then people will really enjoy your beautiful voice to the fullest with the new Philco radio phonograph. Because the same engineers who made Philco America's favorite radio phonograph before the war, the favorite for its beauty of tone, will bring you many new improvements. Yes, when you play your favorite records on your new Philco, you'll realize that you never actually heard them before. For the first time, you'll enjoy the entire tonal range, from deep, mellow bass to high, brilliant treble. You'll hear all those glorious overtones that add such amazing warmth and life to music. Listening to your Philco radio phonograph will be a new experience in entertainment. Studio performance right in your own home. Yes, for that new thrill from both radio and recorded music, be sure to see your Philco dealer after victory. <laughs> the Dean of Modern American Music, the one and only Paul Whiteman. <laughs> Paul, I want you to know that I'm really thrilled to be on the same program with you. Oh, that goes double, Judy. You've been a favorite of mine ever since I saw you in The Wizard of Oz. I like you and the characters in it, especially that scarecrow. Yeah, that scarecrow was a popular figure. Sinatra still is popular. <laughs> you know, Judy, I got a big kick out of your current picture. I loved all that stuff about the 1904 St. Louis Exposition. Oh, did you see the original exposition in 1904, Paul? Oh, don't be silly, Judy. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> you, uh... You weren't... You weren't what? I was just a baby. What? I was three years... Uh, I was five years old. What? Step right up and meet the son, Lionel Barrymore. <laughs> Well, well, Paul, what's going to be your next trip to the land of music? Judy, I'm going to take this trip with a man named Les Paul, who was recently discharged from the Army and who is one of the greatest players of the electric guitar I've ever heard. What do you know something, Judy? Sure. When Les was in the Army, he played on so very many of the Armed Forces Radio Service programs, he became a favorite of our GIs overseas. It all adds up to his being one of the best electric guitar players in the world. Took the word smack dab out of my mouth, Judy, and he's going to show just why we think he's so good when the orchestra with Les Paul as soloist plays Cole Porter's Begin the Begin. <laughs> Thank you. 
same opens its door to and dusts off a pedestal for two old gentlemen whose names have become practically synonymous with radio, and they really belong in your Radio Hall of Fame. Back in 1931, these two venerable veterans of the ether waves opened the Jotham Down store in Pine Ridge, Arkansas, which they've operated for the benefit and enjoyment of radio audiences from coast to coast almost nightly for the last 14 years. During that time, they firmly entrenched themselves as Pine Ridge's favorite sons and leading citizens, They've become the dominant industrial and social force in the town and have striven always for a higher standard of ignorance. Those two beloved oh, gentlemen... Mom, I'd love to meet them two fellas. Hey, She's talking about us. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I'm referring to those two beloved old storekeepers from Pine Ridge, Lum and Abner. <laughs> Well, thank you, Miss Gordon. It was mighty thoughty of you to say them nice things about us. Amen. <laughs> well, now that you're here, what are you going to do for us? Do? Are we supposed to do something? Oh, yes, yes. Everyone who, who enters the Radio Hall of Fame sings a song or tells a story, does a dance. Dance? Well, law me, I couldn't dance with Lum. He's too tall for me. <laughs> well, perhaps you can do a sketch then. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're thespians, aren't you? No, we're both from Arkansas. <laughs> Well, I know a short play you might do. Well, good. Yeah. Well, the scene of this play is... is oh, wait a minute, the... Miss Garland. Abner, listen to this. I want your judgment on the play. Oh, well, uh, uh, Mom, I, I can't judge nothing like that. I just ain't got the ignorance for it. Well, you can help some. Two heads is always better than one. Well, I'm just a period, Mom. I... Huh? Huh? Yeah, uh, huh? What did you say about them two heads? I said two heads is better than one. See things from two different angles that way. Oh, yeah, that's right. Of course, that'd be a right smart of an expense, old lum. A fella'd have to buy two haircuts at a time and two pairs of spectacles. Abner, I ain't talking about one man with two heads. I'm talking about two men with one head. Or two men with two heads. Well, I do know. Four heads betwixt them, huh? <laughs> no, I, I mean, well, here, how many heads have you got? I ain't got but one. It ain't me, lum. Who ain't you? This here two-headed feller, whoever he is. I right, don't get wait a minute. Maybe it's that fellow over there. Along. Where? My there. That would keep shaking that stick at that band there. Oh, that's Paul Whiteman. He ain't got two heads. Well, no. He, he's got a good start on it, though. He's got two chins. <laughs> Abner, watch what you're saying. What I meant was that me and you together can have more ideas with two heads. Oh, yeah, if we had them, we could, I reckon. <laughs> I do because that'd be right handy, you know it, Lum? A fella could eat with one mouth and drink coffee with the other and never miss a leg. <laughs> of course, it would be sort of a bother, though, to have to use both hands when you want to tip your hat to some woman. Oh, my goodness, I mean, you've got the craziest imagination I've ever seen on a human. Yeah, see, you know, an extra head would be nice company for a fella, Lum. Him and himself could sort of get up a checker game, couldn't they? <laughs> Reckon they'd get into an argument with yourself that way? I don't know. That'd be awful handy for watching a tennis game. You wouldn't have to keep swinging your one head backwards and forwards. For goodness sakes, Abner, hash up and let Miss Garland tell us about this play we're going to do. Go ahead, Miss Garland. Well, the the scene is laid in the in the frozen north where the... Well, north good morning, Frank. Good morning, Abner. Uh, excuse me, Miss Garland. Howdy, Frank. Er, Frank. Frank who? Where? Huh? Who was that you were speaking to? Oh, oh, nobody. I, I was just wondering if I did have two heads, I'd speak to myself when I woke up. Is he always like this? Oh, just ignore him, Miss Garland. He's got the idea now that he's got two heads. Oh, well, in his case, it might help. Huh? Well, anyway, Lum, the, the play opens in the frozen north where the nights are six months long. Six months? Hmm. Danny, that won't be a good play. If I go to bed in it at once, the audience will never see me again. They ain't going to wait six months for me to get up. Frank, well, I look, wish the people quit there don't night. sleep oh, all no, the time. You do, no, you I reckon some of them get up early. early. More than likely now, set their alarm clock for about half past April or quarter of June. Undoubtedly. Anyway, the role you will play is that of an old trapper. An old what? An old trapper. I've never done it. You did too. You've been up in this country all of your life. Wait a minute, Miss Gordon. will you shut that up for goodness sake? Frank started it. Well, tell Frank to hatch a... Frank started. Go on, Miss Garland. Well, 
You're, you're a trapper, and, and you live with the Eskimos, and their, and their house is built of ice. You see, it's terribly cold up there. Well, I ain't surprised it'd be cold anywhere living in a house built out of ice. Yes, but these are especially built ones. You've seen pictures of those little round houses built in the snow. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Gigolos, they call them. <laughs> no, 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 igloos. Uh, a gigolo is a fellow who earns his living by dancing with women. You mean I'm going to dance with a bunch of Eskimo women? No, no, you're not a gigolo. You're an igloo. I mean, no, you're a trapper. Don't and... get that lump back. Oh, and, and one day, no one day you're mushing your way over the Dawson Trail when you come upon an old man and his no, beautiful listen, daughter who have lost their way in the snow. Well, do we have to have that old man in this? Wait a minute, Abner, for goodness sakes, will you please hang that up? I was just taking up for you. Taking up for him? Yes, sir. Frank said you was backwoods. He said you couldn't understand nothing. Well, both of you keep quiet then. I ain't going to sit here and let him talk about you to your back. I on. don't care if he does talk about me. Just keep both yourselves quiet so Miss Garland can well, explain Well, Frank this. was the one that started If over. you say Frank one more time, I'm going to whop you right on top of the head. Oh. Uh, which one? Oh, <laughs> Go on, Miss Garland. I believe he meant you, Frank. That's who he's talking to. Well, anyway, anyway, Lum, you, you take this beautiful girl and her father back to your igloo. Oh, oh does she fall in love with him? Well, now, don't get so excited. Don't cross your bridges until you come to them. You see, the father is uh, ill. And... She said don't cross your bridges till you come to him. Oh, uh, whereabouts is a bridge at, Miss Garland? Well, there isn't really any bridge, Abner. Well, what'd you tell us not to cross it for, then? She never said not to cross she it. She did done it. I heard her. Said, don't cross the bridge till we come to all it. All right, all right. We've crossed the bridge. Now, let's forget it. Hmm? Are we over on the other side now? <laughs> yes, yes. Go ahead, Miss Garland. Uh, how'd we get across? Oh, for uh... kitty's sake. Hey. Uh, I bound you. We went across in a boat. I is that the right answer? Yes, yes. Anything. <laughs> Proceed, Miss Garland. Well, let's see. Now, where were we? But we just crossed the river. Oh, yeah. No. Well, anyway, uh, Lum carries the old man inside, and then the, then the girl walks up to the igloo. A and they start dancing? No. Oh. Say, could Frank play the part of the igloo? <laughs> oh, Lum, would you please keep him quiet till I finish this? Ain't nothing I can do, Miss Garland. I brung him up here. That's all I can do. Like that old lettered saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Huh? Go uh, on, Miss Garland. Whose horse won't drink? Anybody's horse. Well, what's the matter with him? <laughs> there ain't nothing the matter with him. Well, there must be if he won't drink long. Uh, maybe he's got the lampers. I know one time Grandpappy Spears, he had a horse that wouldn't drink. So, it. Lum must get the old man to a doctor. But he has to cross the bridge, and the bridge is washed out. Well, no wonder we couldn't cross it a while ago. <laughs> is that why we use them boats? Yes. Now, are you happy? Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> but uh, how, how about the horse? How are we going to get him across? <laughs> He's going to roll the boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be a polka-dotted possum. All right, doggies, I want to see that. Uh, which feet does he roll with, his frontons or his backons? Abner, if you say horse one more time, I'm going to whop you now. Oh, excuse me. All right, Miss Garland, he'll be quiet now. He won't say another word. Well, that's fine, but our time is up now. That's like locking the barn after the horse is stolen. Huh? Oh. Oh, my goodness, you oughtn't have said that. All right, doggies, Lum, come on. we got to get out here and find out who stole that horse. Abner, come back No, here. sir, it ain't every day you find a horse that can row a boat. We can sell him to... Uh, sell him to the milkman here in Los Angeles. Hell, come on, Lum, let's well, go. Looks like I'll have to go and catch Abner, Miss Garland. Well, thanks anyway for visiting the Soco Radio Hall of Fame today, Lum. Oh, not at all, not at all. Just proud to do it. Fact is, I enjoyed myself something wonderful. <laughs> yes, sir, amen. That goes for me, too. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that, Abner. Oh, well, this ain't Abner speaking. Oh, well, who is it, then? It's Frank. Abner's out trying to catch that dead blame <laughs> horse. Come on. <laughs> There's another tune in Meet Me in St. Louis that I think really deserves to be on your Radio Hall of Fame. At the moment, it seems quite timely, and so with Mr. Whiteman's assistance, I'd like to sing it for you now. Have yourself a Merry Christmas. Heart be light. 
your heart be gay Next year all our troubles will be miles away Once again as in olden days Happy golden days of your Kobley's popping eyes and an unusual mustache are certainly not enough to admit anyone to your radio hall of fame. But when said eyes and lip brush belong to a gentleman who used to be one of the best trombone players in the business, good enough to play with the Dorseys, Benny Goodman, and our own Paul Whiteman, and when furthermore said gentleman just returned from a 30,000-mile jaunt to the South Pacific doing a wonderful job entertaining our servicemen, and when in addition he's a completely unique comedian himself and a permanent character on the most popular comedy program in radio, The Bob Hope Show... Well, how are you going to keep him out of the Radio Hall of Fame? Introducing the mustache that walks like a man, Jerry Colonna. Thank you, Judy. (laughs) Well... <laughs> Welcome to the Radio Hall of Fame, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much. How have you been? In the pink. In the pink? Yes. The laundries are mixing up everything these days. Got a belt. Well, Professor, it's been a long time since I've seen you. Remember when we worked on the Bob Hope show together? Ah, yes. Since then, I've had my ups and downs. How come? Swallowed my yo yo. <laughs> <laughs> Professor, you've worked for Hope for a long time. Now, tell me, privately, what do you think of Bob? I think Mr. Hope is the finest boss a man ever had. He's kind. He's generous. He's handsome. He's talented. You know, when you got a wife and kid, they got you up against a wall. <laughs> oh, and then, Jerry, you, you shouldn't feel that way. The Yuletide season is almost here, and everybody should be friends. Oh, yeah? I remember last year, I got dressed to Santa Claus, climbed down someone's chimney, and got arrested. Really? Why? It was four months before Christmas. Oh, Professor, why do you act this way? Well, you see, I never told this to anyone, but when I was a baby, my mother dropped me on my head. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, well, that's all right. You know a better way to crack walnuts? <laughs> oh, Professor, what are your plans for this Christmas? Oh, I'm going to dress up as Santa Claus again, hitch up my radius to a sled, and say, Giddy up, Dunder, Giddy up, Blitzen, Giddy up, Eleanor. Eleanor? Yes. She's just going along for the ride. <laughs> Then, Judy, I'll travel from rooftop to rooftop. The first stop is Betty Grable's house. You going to fill her stocking? No, she fills it so much better herself. <laughs> but I will bring Harry James a bugle. Why a bugle? Maybe I can get him to blow. <laughs> ah, that Betty Grable. She's so beautiful. She brings out the Bob Hope in me. <laughs> ah, but what if Harry sticks around? Then there'll be nothing doing. And I'll tell you why. All right. So I want to live To drink a pint's fullness Take all I can give I love a night 
every home of the town To glory in its sunshine and revel in its power I love life, I want to be Life. I love it for its well. I love all the music, so glad summer melody gay. Ah, so we'd be a story of a life at last I found you. Oh, that's why that is what I bought. Who's that boy? To drink of life's fullness, ain't all I can give. I love the life, every form of the town. To glory in its sunshine and to revel in its town. I love life, I want to live. I love life. I love life. about life. The last few years have put all mechanical products to a severe test. Due to shortages in replacement parts and shortage of manpower for service, all kinds of household appliances have been subjected to strains they would never encounter in ordinary use. Philco looks with pride on the way Philco refrigerators have come through these years. There has never been a finer proof of the quality and dependability built into every Philco product. These years have also served to prove the value of many innovations in the new kind of refrigerator which Philco introduced before the war. Homes equipped with Philco refrigerators have had many occasions to be glad that their Philco had a separate storage compartment for frozen food, for it enabled them to buy meats and poultry when it was available and store it away for later serving. And it provided plenty of space to store packaged frozen foods, saving many a trip to the market. When victory is won and these Philco engineers have finished their war assignments, a new Philco refrigerator is coming which will continue this record of advanced design quality, and dependability. Watch Philco in refrigeration after the war. Your Radio Hall of Fame continues after station identification. This is the Blue Network. You are listening to Philco's Radio Hall of Fame, which today gives a citation to these stars made great by your recognition of their achievements. Lumen Abner, Jerry Colonna, Les Paul and his trio, Paul Whiteman, and your mistress of ceremonies, Judy Garland, who stepped out of her niche to resume her mistress of ceremony ink. Well, when you have an artist on a program like Les Paul, who plays an electric guitar, it's very hard to resist saying things like this. They like the voltage in that electric guitar of yours so much less. How about throwing the switch and turning on some more juice and giving us another sample of your high-frequency music? But I'm going to resist saying that. Because, after all, when musicians like Les Paul and his trio play a galumptious number like Blue Skies, you don't really have to say anything more than that. So, Les, the stage is yours. Thank you. 
morning, Les. Oh, Miss Garland. Yes, Lum. Uh, me and Abner got to be getting on back to Pine Ridge and we come to say goodbye. Oh, that's very sweet of you. And, and, and we just want to tell you, Miss Garland, that it's, it's been a pleasure. I know we're getting to work with a genuine movie star. <laughs> you know, someday maybe we can do a love scene together. Uh, just the three of us. Well, <laughs> well, why don't we do one right now? We've got a famous Hollywood director with us. Who's that? Why, it's me, me, J. Orson Colonna, genius at the cinema, expert on Technicolor, producer of Class A pictures, also cigarettes rolled while you wait. <laughs> uh, <laughs> say, uh, <laughs> uh, say, Lom. Yeah, I am, man. If this feller here, this Colonna's, if he had two heads, would they both have mustaches? Uh, <laughs> oh, just come to think of it, though, I believe he's got enough air to cover both faces. <laughs> well, look, let's get on with this picture. I've got an idea. We can do a road picture. Now, Lum and Abner, you can be Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. Yeah, I'll, I'll be Bing. Now, why do you think you ought to be Bing? Well, if I ever do catch that dad blame horse, I could race him at San Anita. <laughs> All right, I'll be that other fellow, whoever you said, Bob Hope or somebody. I never hear that. <laughs> perfect, perfect casting. Perfect casting. <laughs> what do you mean, Terry? The man from the corn country is playing the part of Corny. <laughs> if uh, Hope is listening in, I'm only kidding. <clears throat> now, what's the title of this road picture? Well, now, let me see. The, the, um, the Road to Romance. Do you like that? Ah, yes. Especially the detours. <laughs> Granny's me playing Bob Hope. Now, there's a part I can sink my teeth into. Sink your teeth in? Mom, well, you ain't got Bob Hope mixed up with Lassie, have you? <laughs> well, I can tell him a part easy. It's Kelowna I have trouble with. Uh, Judy, what are you going to play? Oh, I'll be Dorothy Lamour. Oh. Where's your sarong? Well, I'll make believe I'm wearing a sarong. Make believe? Dorothy Lamour don't make believe she's wearing a sarong. She don't hide anything. <laughs> Abner, that's a horse of another color. I've seen her in a moving picture. Huh? Uh-oh. Uh, what, what color was he in the first place, Lon? I don't know. Well, how do you know it's a horse of another color? Look, Abner, all I said Action! Was... Lights! Camera! Action! Ready! Lights! Well, wait, camera! Professor, we haven't even rehearsed yet. I know, but I'm going to get into this conversation somehow. <laughs> now, look, look. This is the idea of the scene. Lum and Abner are fighting for my hand. Hand? That's what she said. Is that all we get? <laughs> it's a rest arbor I'm crazy about. Listen to Miss Garland. I, I've got a hand. See, look there, I've got two of them. One, two, right I there. know how many hands you've got. Of course, now, with two heads, maybe I could use extra hands. <laughs> Abner, Abner, in this scene, my, my foolish little heart tells me that I love you. It does? Well. So I take your face in my hands and I kiss it. Oh, I just hope I get the kiss. That's what I hope. Why shouldn't you? Oh, that dad blame Frank will shove my head. In the <laughs> oh, Frank's in again, I see. Wait a minute, wait a minute, fellas. I'm the director. I'll show you how to do it. Come here, Judy. Just a minute. That ain't in the script here. You had to open your big mouth. <laughs> Oh, now, Abner, let's get ready for the last scene. You play the part of Bing Crosby, so you sing to me. Oh, I I'm Bing, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and a bubble of the night. Kids singing, pipe down, meets the gold of the day. I told you to headshot. Now, cut it out. Headshot right now. Quit singing. Wait a minute. Who's telling you to shut up? Frank. <laughs> Frank. Yeah, I, I just found out he, his last name is Sinatra.
forgive my becoming somewhat lyrical, but I believe the man of whom I'm going to speak and to whom Paul Whiteman, Les Paul, the trio, Paul Whiteman's orchestra and chorus and yours truly pay tribute, is worthy of lyrical praise. He's composed hundreds of songs, melodious, poignant, wistful, tender, and utterly enchanting. Jerome Kern has brought to the treasury of American song the wealth of his own great talent, and he's enriched the American scene for his being part of it. Because our own Paul Whiteman is honorary chairman of Kern Jubilee Week, in which the entire entertainment world pays homage to this great composer, in his honor we play and sing his music.
Ladies and gentlemen, all good things, including pre- pleasant radio programs with such stars as Laman Abner, Jerry Colonna, Les Paul and his trio, and Paul Whiteman, must come to, well, whatever pleasant programs come to. But before I go, there's something I'd like to say. This is the week before Christmas. There's a song called, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas. A song full of sentiment and nostalgia and memories. A song that's a favorite of our men overseas. For almost every singer who goes over there to entertain is asked by them to sing it. And yet, on this day, a week before Christmas, it's not a white Christmas of which most of us dream, but a peaceful Christmas. I'm dreaming of a peaceful Christmas. Sing the hearts of America's sons and daughters. A peaceful Christmas. When our men who are fighting nature and the enemy, our men who are human like you and I, our men who are asked to endure beyond human endurance the cold and the mud as they fight through the czar, the mud and the cold as they fight through Italy, the jungle and rain and mosquitoes as they fight through Leyte. When these men have cast off their uniforms and dropped their guns, and empty places at the Christmas table will be filled, and the places still empty will be filled by memories whose bitterness has been sweetened by time. And men who perhaps have never seen their children will play Santa Claus for their children with red garments and white whiskers, replacing the grime and dirty beards they now wear. And Christmas will have a meaning, will have the meaning it was meant to have by those who loved him. I'm dreaming of a peaceful Christmas, and so are you. And there are times when it may seem far off, but it'll come. It will come. This is Judy Garland waving goodbye to your Radio Hall of Fame and to Jimmy Wallington, who still has a few duties to perform before switching off the light. Ladies and gentlemen, have you seen your newspaper today? Of course you read the headlines that report the progress of our men on the fighting front. But how closely did you read and interpret the headline that reports the progress of our home front battle, the sixth war loan? If your community is lagging behind in its quota and you still haven't bought your extra war bonds, You have a decision to make that you can't escape. Are you content that your community should be among those who fail to do their part? Do you believe that you can leave it to your neighbors to carry your share of the burden? The one right answer to these questions will lead you to act without delay, no matter what the inconvenience or the sacrifice. At least one extra war bond over and above your regular purchases will put you in the clear. Buy it. And buy it this week without fail from your Victory Volunteers. Next week, your Radio Hall of Fame in which Philco brings you each week the stars made great by your recognition of their achievements, brings you a special Christmas show with two of the greatest personalities in the entertainment world, Bing Crosby 
and Orson Welles. This is Jimmy Wallington, who will be at the same old stand next week, ready to escort you through the gates of your Radio Hall of Fame. Radio Hall of Fame is produced by Tom McKnight. This is the Blue Network.